Hi, I'm Han Brown, and uh, thank you for tuning in. This conversation is live streaming on all the various social media platforms. Do you know that poor sleep habits are the main cause of the increase in mental health problems? Well, as our lives continue to get busier, sleep becomes less and less of a priority. The consequences are more than just tiredness, poor quality or quantity can lead not only to issues with cognitive function, but also an increase in confusion as well as personality changes. These changes make it difficult for seniors who suffer from these disorders to make good decisions regarding their daily routine. Poor sleep and mental health go hand in hand. Research shows that people who don't get enough sleep, I should say enough good quality sleep, tend to experience more anxiety and depression than those who do. Sleep deprivation is also linked to increased risk for suicide attempts. So it goes without saying that getting a good night's rest is crucial for your overall well-being. So join me today is Dr. Mohammed Nami. He will share tips on how you can improve your sleeping pattern. Dr. Mohammed Nami is a highly accomplished neuroscientist. He has published over 150 peer-reviewed papers and book chapters. He also serves as the National Brain Mapping Lab Advisory Board member for neuroscience. He also spends his time teaching neuroscience to medical students. So Dr. Mohammed, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm very, very pleased to be here and thanks for making that happen. Great, thank you. Look forward to this conversation because sleep affects everybody, but particularly adverse impact on seniors. So yeah, you're right. um, our bodies, let's back up. <laughs> um, on a personal side, can you share with us something, um, you know, your your day to day activities and um, I guess what brought you to being so passionate about uh, sleep and cognitive uh, studies? Yeah, you're right. I am passionate about sleep and cognitive studies, and it all started like 10, 15 years ago and maybe almost like 15 years ago. Uh, I was uh, I was after having completed my course of study as a medical doctor, as an MD, and I was I was thinking, okay, well, I'm going to pretty much chose my own course to go for uh, further studies and just go to, for postgraduate you know, qualifications. And because just I wanted to learn more about something which has not been, the, the puzzle which has not been really solved yet. And I was interested in the concept of neurology and neuroscience and psychiatry and everything which relates to the brain, this miraculous work in between our ears. And then... Uh, I didn't like the high school science that much. I, don't, I didn't like the, the questions that you can find the answers literally in the back of the book. So I was thinking about something that I'd like to explore myself. And then I found my way into the field of PhD in, I mean, PhD study in neuroscience. And then when I was doing my studies and, 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 and I mean, coursework and, and PhD in neuroscience, then I tapped into, and I just bumped into the concept of epilepsy research. Then I, when I was doing epilepsy research, I found out that some people with epilepsy, they found they have some abnormal behaviors during their sleep. Then I was immersed in the very questionable and mysterious world of sleep science and sleep medicine. Then I found my own way and I pretty much chose my own course to go and study sleep as, as my thesis. Then I did like years and years of humble experience in, in sleep research. Then I did my fellowship in sleep medicine as a clinical fellowship, you know, uh, a scholar and also practitioner. And I'm now, uh, you know, uh, just the director of the brain cognition of behavior at the Department of Neuroscience at Shiraz University of Medical Sciences in Iran, where we have like 18 PhD students. Sleep is a part of our research and studies, also cognitive uh, investigations. And we do have a brain health center. We, we, we see many seniors with sleep problems. And when we, we together, we agreed that this is going to be the topic of the discussion, I was so fascinated. So let's uh, let's get it started. And I know that as long as you steer the process, we're going to sit well. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. So now our bodies change as we get older. 
And one of those changes is that our sleep schedules start to shift. So let's talk about the significance of sleep disorders in older adults. What is sleep disorder and what risks come from having a sleep disorder? You know, if, if we're going to tap into the concept of neurological and also psychiatric issues, which result from inadequate sleep or inefficient sleep, specifically in the elderly and also senior population, we've got to bear in mind that there is a general saying in neuroscience that the sleep is of the brain, for the brain, and by the brain. So when we do not take enough and efficient sleep, then one of the key organs, which is going to be negatively affected and the quality and quantity of the processing and also the functionality of that organ is going to be negatively hampered is the brain right so and we 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 don't care about the brain that much because that works so impeccably and precisely that we even do not realize that we have a brain behind our ears behind our eyes sorry and like what we sometimes we forget that we're having the eyeglasses wearing okay that's like we Sometimes if we have a very, very tiny little speck in my skin that I show to several doctors, but I never check up my brain. I never check up my, my sleep quality. Sometimes when people come to our doors and they're complaining about sleep problems, specifically when we're talking about the senior population, they are really in advanced critical situation. They might even lose their lives if the problem is not correctly diagnosed and properly treated, okay? But many people, if they have some, you know, predicament, some specific, you know, uh, uh, easy to handle problem with sleep, they say, okay, I snore, everyone snores. Mm -hmm. I have bad dreamings, I have nightmare disorder, everyone goes for goes through bad dreaming and nightmare stuff. You know, but some people, I have tooth grinding, many people have tooth grinding, so no big deal. But they do not follow that up with the sleep specialist, sometimes because they do not even know that there is something called sleep specialty. They do not know that we have sleep specialists. We, we got people that they, are, that they have expertise in evaluating the wide uh, range of sleep-related predicaments. And as you know, we got more than 80 types of sleep disorder. Many of them, they got some serious things to do with the brain. Mm -hmm. So when we do not care about our sleep, then we're not care about our, when we're not caring about our brain health. So brain health, as you indicated very beautifully in your, uh, in your introduction, sleep and brain health are really interdigitated. And uh, when we are talking about the health, healthy aging, we need to uh, scrutinize the prerequisites for uh, healthy sleep. And this is exactly what we're going to, you know, uh, deep dive as we're just moving down to this down the road of discussion together with you. Does that right, make sense? Right. Absolutely. Thank you for that insight. Now, what, um, what are some warning signs of a sleep disorder? Uh, you know, if, if I hear the question correctly, you were asking about the neural signs of sleep disorders, what? Yeah. What are some of the warning signs of sleep disorder? How can you tell uh, if okay. a person or a senior um, is going through a sleep disorder? Exactly. So if we are not aware of, uh, uh, of the quality of our sleep and how we sleep overnight, then we can see some symptoms during the day. If I'm a scholar, if I'm a student, if, if I'm a person like an like a, a executive person, a person who needs to use the brain very, very precisely and you know effectively throughout a day, and I realize that I do not function as I used to. So uh, I, I forget about the things very easily. I wander about. I misplace the objects. I uh, I do not have this cognitive agility and the, the cognitive aptitude that I used to have before. It does not have anything to do with the age. I mean, even even younger people they might come up with some subjective cognitive impairments and they go to a doctor, they say, okay, I got memory problem. The doctor does the examination, which is not the rule. They do not do the examinations for the memory all the time. Sometimes they directly go for prescription other medications, but best scenario, they do the cognitive evaluations. And okay, and I would say, okay, Ms. Uh, Pan, okay, Mohammed, or whoever, you got subjective cognitive impairment memory problem. Here are some vitamins or I don't know what, which are going to help you or some memory enhancers, but they do not do the trick. 
because the problem is somewhere else. We are just pruning the tree. I mean, we're just decorating this tree and just going for very minuscules. But the problem is the, is the root of that tree. If we are not targeting the root cause of the problem for the cognitive impairments, specifically when we do not expect that to happen as a popular scenario, then it, it, is, it is like by prescribing medications or going for cognitive rehabilitation as if we, we're not doing a good help. I mean, as if we're riding on water, okay? So because of that, we got to be very, very cautious about the symptoms. If the person has got morning fatigue, dry mouth, and easy fatigability, irritability, lack of impulse control, the person goes angry very easily. Something very, very minor is going to drive the person off the wall. So this is not something expected. And uh, over and above, people would have issues with their blood pressure, with obesity, they got uh, diabetes, and they go to the endocrinologist, they go to the internal medicine experts, they're taking a bunch of medication, but the medication is not really helpful. Mm -hmm. You know what? This is, there, there's a statement written in our books, and it says, if someone is taking the antihypertensive medications for hypertension, and the hypertension is still uncontrolled, go and check their sleep, mm -hmm. you know? And also obesity. I am on diet, I'm doing, you know, a very, very heavy exercise, but I fail to lose my weight. And one of the reasons up behind that is that I do not take a good sleep. So let's catch up some sleep. And by that, we can have a better uh, chance for living a healthier life in different dimensions. So uh, cognitive impairments in, a, uh, in reply to your question, number one, which is unexpected. Uh, and uh, I mean, lack of mood control, depression, anxiety, and easy, easy irritability and anger and aggression. Mm -hmm. And also uh, when people have got some physical issues, you got like metabolic symptoms, uh, by that they got to just, you know, it rings the bell. So the, doc the people need, need to go and see a doctor specialist for that. In some occasions they got to be doing, undergoing sleep tests, which is literally referred to as polysomnography or like sleep checkup, if you like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. You know, I knew that it was important, but um, I guess it's common that in general, people don't see the value of that because we treat other symptoms that are perhaps more on the surface. But it sounds like underneath it all, the core reason could be just getting proper sleep. So thank you. Thank you. So now what... Um, in society today, what do you think the status of understanding of sleep disorder? Oh, wow. It's not good. I mean, uh, it's nothing better than disappointing. I mean, many, many, even not only at the public level, Ms. Han, but, but also at the level of uh, the overall practice and general practice of the healthcare providers. They, we, we have, as healthcare providers, we, we very, very uh, scarcely scrutinize the sleep problem. And we just ask very superficial questions from the referrals. And, okay, do, do you have a good sleep? And the patient says, yeah, kind of, and that's it, okay? Do you have a good sleep? They say, no, not really. And I'm, then maybe I prescribe some medications, which are like downers or sleep aid medications. Many of these medications are really like poisons. I mean, at, at short term, they are going to help with some sleep catch up, but at long term, they are going to really complicate the sleep problem because we get addicted to those medications. Many of those medications has got really, really high addictive potential, all right? Mm -hmm. And the risk of addiction and dependence or the best scenario tolerance is very high for many of the sleep aid medications and like, like uh, hypnotics and mm -hmm. sedatives. But they, we just prescribe those medications. We are not asking about the sleep habits, the healthy sleep habits. We are not asking about the features and facts and numbers. I mean, everything about the quality and quantity of the sleep as a, as a biological uh, uh, healthy behavior. Some people, they just take, because, you know, generally speaking, as a, like a middle-aged person, we need to have like eight hours of sleep. But the fact of the matter is that many people throughout 20 hours, like seven hours of sleep on average, but many other people you're taking less 
And it's been shown that the people who are taking less than six hours of, of overall sleep throughout 24 hours, less than six hours, they have 63% wow. higher risk for developing neuropsychological and neuropsychopathological symptoms, okay? So by time, they'll be having a wide range of neurological, cognitive, psychiatric, and psycholo psychological issues, okay? But uh, we do not ask about the number of sleeps number of sleeping hours. We do not ask about the symptoms like snoring, like uh, witness apneas or cessation of pause, uh, pauses in the breathing. We do not ask about repetitive, you know, wakes after sleep onset. We also fail to ask more questions about the abnormal behaviors like, like sleep talking, sleep walking, moaning, tooth grinding. Uh, some people, they have sleep, you know, unfortunately, that's a sad scenario, I know, but I, I can recall like five, six patients over the past 20, uh, over the past like 15, 20 years of practice that I had, I, I can recall five patients that they were, that they lost their lives, unfortunately, because of sleepwalking. So they just fell off the stair, staircase. They got out, their, got out their room and they just, you know, uh, fell off and they just had their, you know, uh, head injured. Or maybe they had some abnormal behaviors which were very risky and they, you know, they did, and they took some medication. They overdosed themselves while they were asleep. They were walking. They opened the cupboard. They took the medication. They had like 10, 20 uh, of those pills without even knowing that. Some people had sleep paralysis and they had issues. They were, they were intensely scared of the, of the, of the, of the, I mean, the thing which is happening to them, like a demon sitting on their chest with well, you know, shortness of breath and everything. And they got issues. They had the increased secretion of cortisol and norepinephrine, and they got, uh, you know, like, like a, a myocardial infarction or stroke. And many people, specifically elderly, my father, your father, his mother, her mother, okay, they lose their life, God forbid, someday, some night, at the middle of the night mm -hmm. and and the stroke and mi myocardial infarctions that predominantly happen in the early morning hours like four three to four or five six a.m and they say okay that guy or that gentleman had like stroke had mi and unfortunately passed away but what was the reason the reason was he has been snoring for years he has been having hypoxia He's been having fluctuation of the blood pressure during sleep. He has been having dysrhythmias in the heartbeat. He has been having some dysregulation in the immune system. He's been having some issues with the endocrine parameters. And they were all hand in hand with the sleep by your parameters. And nobody was aware and was not really paying enough attention to those problems. Mm -hmm. You know, Ms. Hatt, Ms. Brown, when I was, I was about to start my career in the study of sleep predicaments, many of my colleagues and Aquinas, the they were just coming, to Max, coming back to me and say, uh, Mo, wh why do you go to study sleep as your future career? That's not complex. So we sleep and then we wake up. It's mm -hmm. easy. Okay, just go and study something prestigious, something complicated, something that you're going to learn a lot about it. And I was like, yeah, double, I mean, uh, I was kind of, you know, uh, 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 not not pretty much sure that yeah, is that a right way that I'm going to, uh, that I'm going through, and am I going to find quite good opportunity for learning? And I can tell you, after fifteen over fifteen plus years of of, of studies and being a restless learner throughout this years, every single day I'm learning something new about sleep. Every single patient who is coming to our doors is a new case scenario. And I have not seen even two single individuals that they sleep quite identically. So mm -hmm. everyone sleeps very uniquely and our brain goes through a specific journey, which is very, very unique. So the sleep, the sleep problems or sleep disorders are very varied and wide varied across and across individuals. And sleep pattern, the sleep mapping, if you like, mm -hmm. the map over sleep is different. Okay. Does that kind of resonate to mm -hmm. the question that you were asking? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So it sounds to me, um, the quantity of sleep is obviously measurable, but the impact, the consequences and the disorders are not as readily tangible or measurable. And I think that's why people underestimate the value of it, you know? 
Um, that's that's my opinion. No, I know that's you touched on true. sleep apnea. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that. So has sleep apnea always been a big deal in the medical field? And elaborate, and how, how do people get it, and how do you fix it? Oh, of course it is. Uh, you know, actually, in our day-to-day -day practice, what we see is that in the sleep clinic, where the majority of the people that are coming to the clinic are suffering from sleep apnea, and they are suffering from that at the very, very intense profound and advanced level. They don't refer to a doctor unless they have something really critical, okay? Because they, they think sometimes when people snore, other people either might find it funny, okay, that's good. Is it snoring? That's funny. Or it's not funny. It's not funny at all. And that is tragic because snoring is like a sign, like a fever. If I have the fever, if I have, this is a symptom, right? And behind this, I might be having some other underlying issue, like an infection or something. And when I snore, in a, in, in, in a fraction of cases, we call it uh, like episodic snoring or habitual snoring, which is fine, okay, no big deal. But, but when in majority of the cases, when they have, uh, I mean, loud snoring, a high pitch snoring, but the sound of the snore is audible from a next door, Okay, in those cases, we're facing a problem which is called hypopnea, or we have flow limitation. This means that like 30% to 60% of the air which is supposed to be inhaled and the oxygen is supposed to be exchanged in my lungs and the oxygen will be delivered to the brain and other vital organs, that is being stolen. Okay, so I wouldn't take in enough air into my lungs. I wouldn't have enough oxygen to nourish the vital organs with the oxygenation, if you can relate to that. So by this, people at least have hypopnea, which means flow limitation while they are sleeping. And the, that might be obstructive, that might be central. By central hypopnea means the, the brain does not send enough signals for effective breathing. That's the central problem. I mean, the area in the, in the brainstem, which is responsible for the depth and the frequency of breathing behavior does not work well, specifically during sleep. And by that, I got pauses. And the culprit for these pauses is the brain. Mm -hmm. The other scenario is that the brain goes beautifully well, but the problem is here. In the back of the throat, in the upper airway, I got a high, high resistance of the tissue. So we have upper airway resistance. And that's a syndrome. So by this, the back of the throat is very bulky. It's very crowded with the tonsils, with the low-lying soft palate, with the wide base of the tongue. And all these things will just stand back when I just, you know, uh, when I sleep uh, like in a supine position, like a belly up position. Okay. So these are going to just stand back and just sort of clock our back of the throat or airway. So by this, people would find, well, this is not normal. I see my grandpa, I see my dad, when they sleep, they got some pauses and they got this snorting and some weird, very noisy and loud sound. And by that they wake up, they do like confusional behavior and then they back to sleep. And this happens like over tens and 10 times. Okay, tens and tens of times overnight. I got people that they have like eight, nine hours of sleep and they have 200 episodes. Of, of apneas or hypopneas. So this is what I'm going to emphasize here. So what I would like to stress is that the number of hypopneas plus apneas per hour, that is an index. We cannot guess about that. We cannot estimate it by just looking at the person. We got to do sleep tests. We got to undergo polysomnography to figure out what is the apnea hypopnea index. So what is literally very, very popularly, we, we refer to that as AHI. AHI is a number of respiratory events within an hour on average during my sleep. If it is more than five, something is not right. If it is between five to 15, I'm having like mild to moderate obstructive sleep apnea hypopnea syndrome. If it is between 15 to 50, 
Then I got severe obstructive sleep apnea hypopnea syndrome, which, which, is, which is just you know, known as OSAHS. So I got OSAHS and the number of AHI is between 15 and, and, and 50, so I got severe. But you know, this is, this is the, uh, the sad part that many, many of the people that we see in the clinic, they have the AHI more than 50. Mm. This means that they have profound OSAHS with critical level of O2 desaturation, of oxygen desaturation. If I do not treat that person tonight, very, very frankly, literally, he might die the next night. Okay. And I have unfortunately and sadly seen some cases, some referrals, some patients that they lost their lives. Okay. But the good news is that when we diagnose the sleep apnea, specifically in the elderly population, specifically in the gentleman, okay, our, 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 our daddies, our grandpas are more at risk as compared to the ladies. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about the um, seniors, male seniors, they have more, of course, if they have the short neck, if they have, you know, the, 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 the fat neck and a whole, so, I mean, the neck circumference or the size of the collar. I mean, you, you, you check that. We normally check that in the clinic with the size of the collar. If it is, you know, wide and short neck, if they have obesity, if their AHI, if a BMI is more than 30, for example, or a body mass index, uh, I, I suppose that many people are familiar with BMI. When it is more than 30, this means that I'm suffering from obesity or at least over, I'm overweight. So, and when they snore, and when they have excessive daytime sleepiness during the day, these are the red flags. So if I am talking about a grandfather, a father who has more than eight, more than 80 years of, uh, more than 50 years of age, he has obesity, he has short neck and wide neck. And also the person, I'm sorry for the noise. I don't know how to just, you know, okay, anyway. And uh, if the person has got issues with snoring, snorting, the pauses in the breathing, and most, uh, most importantly, if the person has got some issues with excessive daytime somnolence or, or very, uh, the person is very sleepy, is talking to you, is dozing off. Uh, and I, I remember uh, like a lady was talking to me about his, uh, his father, her father. And she was telling me like, you know, you know, doc, my father takes the spoon and is going to just take the food. And, you know, in the midway through, he falls asleep. Oh. Or we're talking to my father and he's asleep. Or he just takes some nuts or something. He's just cracking the nuts. And he cracks the nut and then he's got this dozing off. Because when we have this atonia or the paralysis, a lack of the muscle tone in the neck muscles, this means that we might uh, probably have had a long-term sleep deficiency. And because of that, when we fall asleep, we directly go to the REM sleep. And REM sleep is a period of sleep, which is in depth of sleep. Depth of sleep and this is exactly where we are uh, dreaming. Okay, so some elderly people, when they have dementia, when they have early stages of Alzheimer's type dementia or mild cognitive impairment, progressive questionable dementia or some sort of problems of that kind, when they fall asleep, they hallucinate. Mm -hmm. So they, mm -hmm. they see, they hear something and they show weird behavior. Many of these people, unfortunately, when they are when they are not sufficiently examined medically, they are being misdiagnosed for the people who have got auditor hallucination. Okay, this is like a, like a psychotropic medication. So I'm going to give you a medication which is normally prescribed for the people who have got auditory hallucination. Why did I prescribe that? Because you, you told me that you have auditory visual hallucination. Okay, but the problem is not that. The problem is REM it is like a sleep onset REM periods. Some of these people tend to have symptoms similar to narcolepsy. So it's a huge, long, long story. But to cut the story short, what I would like to put here in brackets and put an asterisk above it is that sleep issues ranging from insomnia to all respiratory problems, sleep disordered breathing, they become even more prevalent in 
elderly population, in seniors, our, our daddy, our mom, our grandpa, our grandma, they are the people who are even at more risk compared to the younger generation to experience devastating and sometimes worrisome different levels of sleep-related predicaments. And that relates directly, which if we have time, we'll be touching on that, hopefully. It has really, really solid with dementia. So the, the, I mean, the better we sleep, the later we'll, we'll have the chance for afflicting dementia. Sure, the worst we'll cover that. Sooner. Yeah, we'll cover that. So now, can anyone be affected by sleep disorders during all stages of life? Or are there other factors at play, such as hormonal production and so forth? Yeah, it's a very, very important question. Thank you for bringing that up. And uh, yeah, we, we might be having sleep issues with the, with the kids and, you know, newborns. Uh, if they have trachomalacia, if that issues with the with the breathing, or they have like uh, uh, issues with initiating or maintaining sleep, I the, the youngest kid that I have examined for sleep was like uh, two months old, and uh, the elder the eldest one that I the oldest one that I examined was like 102. But um, for that person, it was very very you know senior, like 102 years of age. I was not really going to help that person, but you know what? Why I did the sleep test? Because the person was like, you know, I don't know how many nights I'm allowed to sleep from now on, but I would like to check if I got some problem that I overcome that problem and I'm going to enjoy the, the sweet slumber even more than before, <laughs> you know? That was the reason that that person was examined. But the sleep, uh, the sleep problem can just happen within the lifespan. Uh, but some specific age spectra are, are really more important. For instance, in, in, uh, in children, we got specific insomnia, which is called behavioral insomnia of childhood, or we have a wide range of sleep-related behavioral disorders and also sleep epilepsy syndromes. And for the youngsters and also teenagers, we might be having issue with addictive behavior, you misusing, overusing technology, poor sleep habits, not following the sleep hygiene recommendations so they do not go to bed early and they wake, wake up very late uh, the middle of the day. And uh, for the for the middle aged people, as I said, we start to have some specific concerns about the sleep related breathing disorder, specifically in middle aged men. But when it comes to uh, uh, ladies at childbearing age, they got issues with their perimenstrual syndrome. When we have the fluctuation of the hormones, they might be having issues with 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 the duration of sleep and also the quality and the bioparameters of sleep. So the sleep is not going to be refreshing enough for them. And they when they wake up in the morning, they, they feel that what they have been really unrested. And also for during the pregnancy, and I've, I've published a couple of you know humble papers regarding the range of sleep problems and during pregnancy. And uh, in, the, in each of the trimesters during pregnancy, we're facing a specific, you know, range of sleep problems. And uh, later in the life for ladies, when we're facing the drop in the sex hormone, uh, and also they do have issues with the peri, uh, with the premenopausal state. So when they are just entering the, uh, the menopausal state, then they start to have the hot flashes. They start to have, you know, uh, issues with the, with the integrity of the sleep cycles with the proportion of the sleep stages. So maybe some people do not know about what I'm talking about now. Mm -hmm. We have stage one, stage two, stage three, or N1, N2, N3, shallow sleep, somewhere in between, and deep sleep, okay? N1, two, and three. And then we have REM sleep. And N1, two, three, and REM sleep, generally, if we're, we just put them really integrated, this is called the sleep cycle. And we have four or five sleep cycles every night. It's like a journey. It's like we're going up and down and up and down and up and down, then we wake up in the morning, okay? So this is called sleep stages and the, and the collection of those sleep stages together within like 90 minutes is called the sleep cycle. So it should go through a specific integrity and pattern. So people, as they age, they lose this in sleep cycle integrity and they, they lose this pattern, the structure, the engineering of the different you know, stages and the map of the sleep is, is, is in many instances uh, is going to become distorted. That's why uh, sleep problems are really uh, salient when we're uh, putting into the 
uh, 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 perspective, the population, like seniors, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, let's go a little deeper dive to sleep and dementia. Okay, so clearly not getting enough rest can lead to a weakened state and it might also lead to dementia. So can you go into a deeper dive in the correlation between sleep deprivation and dementia? Exactly. So the, the, the science between sleep deprivation and memory problem is, is really deep and it's very long and rich. So uh, when we go back into like 30 years ago, we got early papers that they are that they were just examining the, the detrimental impact of sleep loss or total sleep deprivation in the animal models in the laboratories and how the memory is going to be negatively impacted. All right. So there is no question regarding the, the impact of, of lack of sleep to the memory and cognitive predicaments. And the reason behind this has been really, you know, very steadily allotted to over the over the past 10, 15 years. Because now we know that sleep deprivation causes the accumulation of the pro-inflammatory mediators in the brain. And those mediators that they are inflammatory, mainly they are cytokines or interleukins. Some of them are called, this is, this is really interesting, they call death ligands. These are the ligands, these are the proteins, these are the peptides that when they attach to the surface of the neurons, they cause cell death. Full stop. Right, so the cell death is like it, it, that calls that is called apoptosis. So when we have the predominance of the pro-inflammatory cascades within the cells and the microenvironments between the brain uh, uh, cells, specifically the neurons, then by time we're going to have this uh, this apoptotic pathways really ignited. Then we have the accelerated process for loss of the brain tissue. And when the brain tissue is going to be susceptible to this lack of oxygenation, number one, number two is that they, they, we have the accumulation and uh, like building up of the, of the toxic materials in the brain. And then we do not get enough sleep. Then this goes on and on. And that's going to be a cumulative process because we got compelling evidence showing that the toxic materials and those inflammatory materials, the waste materials, if you like, in the brain, they are swiped off from the brain during the sleep and only during sleep. Because we got a system that is composed of two components. Number, number one, the lymphatic system in the brain. And number two is the glial system. Glial, are, glial cells are supportive cells. They are not neurons, but they're very similar, right? So they are like two different corridors. Number one, lymphatic, and number two, glial. So this collective sy system is, is referred to as glymphatic system. And the glymphatic system is responsible for clearing up the brain from the waste material during sleep. If we don't sleep well, then the brain would not get a chance of getting cleared off from the waste material. And those waste materials are generally toxic and they cause cell death. And the cells within the, I mean, the temporal parts of the brain that we call them like hippocampus, which is a very, very critical structure for coding and decoding of the memory function. So when the, when the hippocampus and the parahippocampal structures, amygdala and structures and deep seated structures in the lateral part of the brain, I mean, the sides of the brain, when they get shrunk by time, people will start having issues with memory, learning, attention, language, decision-making, reasoning, planning, executive functions, and so on and so forth. So by this, the person will, will come to a doctor, come to the healthcare provider, get examined, and unfortunately, again, I'm gonna re-emphasize, reiterate it. This is under-attended. Many, many doctors and nurses and healthcare providers they don't really pay enough attention to the importance of sleep in that kind of thing. So they just directly go, go for cognitive rehabilitation or they go for stimulation of the brain. The, the, I mean, the most sophisticated approaches that we have are this, right? TMS, TES, or the stuff like that. But the common practice is that we go for medication prescriptions and uh, also cognitive rehab, memory rehab. It does not do the trick because the problem is with lack of sleep 
The problem is with the related sleep problems that I said, they are very, very numerous. We got more than 80 types of different sleep disorders. We got at least 14 different types of insomnia. It's not like, okay, I got insomnia. Well, for I'm fine. I'm going to give you a sleep aid medication. Go and take it. No, that's not it. We need to scrutinize. We need to really isolate what kind of insomnia is like there and what is the exact uh, sleep-related disorder or the combination of those sleep-related symptoms that we need to target. And I said that the good news is that for 80% of the instances, we can slow down the progression. We can treat the patient in a very, very efficient way because we got very, very good remedies provided we have a distinct, precise diagnosis, we can provide distinct, precise treatment and remedies for that. But that's mm -hmm. not that's not the common way that now we're seeing in, in everyday practice. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Wow, so, so is it true that lack of sleep can decrease cognitive function by up to 40%? It is, yeah. So there was a study in 2016 and that was published in Nature. Okay, and the study was was called a share study, and that was like a population based study, and they they were uh, examining the cognitive function of the elderly people of the seniors. Many of them were enrolled into the daycare centers, and some of them are with a home setting. All right, so they were examined for their cognitive aptitude for cognitive performance, and it was shown that they have 40 percent decline in their cognitive aptitude, in their cognitive, uh, I mean, uh, uh, parameters. And they did the retrospective analysis for the history of sleep problems. So it's like a retrospective cohort, right? So they looked back, those people who have had at least 40% of, uh, of sleep, uh, of cognitive decline, they found to have over 70% prevalence of sleep-related issues. Okay, so 70% of the people, this is, this is the take home message from that article, from that research, 70% of the people that they have sleep issues and they do not take care of that will end up with 40% decline in their cognitive performance within next 10 years. And that's stunning, right? And that's really astonishing because it has been also shown in another set of publications and, and uh, evidence-based, I mean, uh, literature. When if, if I do have sleep uh, problems, sleep snoring, for example, or insomnia, if I'm not treated, if I have apnea, if I'm not treated, my uh, 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 the, the the onset of dementia or my cognitive impairment is going to be advanced for ten years. So if I'm supposed to be afflicted with, with MCI or, or dementia by the age of 70, if I'm not treating my sleep apnea, I will certainly get it by the age of 60. And that is not our assumption. This is evidence-based uh, literature, okay? This is, this is science. So if I do not treat my snoring, I would have sleep, uh, I mean, the, the onset of the, uh, the dementia to advance for like five years, okay? So 10 years, five years advancement, early, uh, early risk for dementia. This is, this is really something. And this is, this is truth. I mean, this is like, a, like uh, the facts that we are now referring to in our books. And if two people, if I and you, for example, let's say that we're middle-aged, all right? If I and you, we, both of us genetically, we're bearing a gene which is going to increase the, the constitutional risk for being afflicted with dementia at the age of 60, okay? Like, it, I know that you're familiar with it, many of the people who are watching this. There is a gene called EPO epsilon E4, E1 or E4, okay? So these are the genes, and these are new. I mean, uh, since 2004, they have been discovered. So this EPO epsilon 4 is a gene, I have it, you have it. I snore, I have sleep breathing disorder, you don't. I get diagnosed with, with advanced dementia of Alzheimer's type at the age of 60, you are 70 and you're as sharp as a tack because you do not have 
uh, the sleep-related problems. So this has been shown that those who have the background or genetic predisposition for dementia, right. and concurrently they have sleep problem, that would be at, 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 at a substantial increased risk for developing dementia of Alzheimer's type as they age. So these are really something that I'm, I'm very fortunate to just share the idea here with you. So if your dad, your mom, your loved one, your, your wife, your husband, or someone has got some, some signs and symptoms of sleep related problems, let's go, let's go for it. Let's, yeah. let's check about that importance. I, I think that's great. Um, the fact, you know, we can have these conversations, bring awareness so that people can take proactive actions, right? Um, as opposed to going in to see and have it checked when it's too late. So I think it's wonderful. Now let's talk about technology. So do you think that technology is affecting our sleep or taking time away from it? And what do you think we can do about it? Yeah, uh, technology of both for the younger generation and both for seniors, that should be really regulated. I mean, the use of technology should be regulated. We need to use the technology and not vice versa. So the technology should not be using us. I mean, the screen time, uh, people are looking at uh, watching films or just you know browsing the social media for hours. And specifically when it comes to the evening hours, that's going to be really toxic and it's going to leave a detrimental effect on the, 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 the secretion of the, of the protein, a neuropeptide or hormone in our brain, which is called melatonin. Melatonin is not a hypnotic agent, but that, uh, that is a chronotherapeutic, uh, like, uh, like, like a chronobiological agent. What it, what it means is that it just sets the timing for sleep and wakefulness. So if this, if this is secreted right in a timely manner and uh, correctly based on the expression of the genes and stuff, so by that, I'm going to have a good pattern for my sleep wake. But if it does not, I'm going to just, you know, lose the benefit of having a timely, efficient, and enough sleep, hours of sleep. So partly that's because I, I, I intentionally and purposefully, I'm changing my my day, uh, you know, uh, sleep and wake habits, right? And specifically, that is a really, really significant uh, red flag uh, for, uh, for, for the youngsters. I mean, the adolescents, they are overusing the technology and they are using this uh, even more and more as we develop newer technologies, okay? Mm -hmm. So we were just, you know, immersed in the social media like crazy and we do not take care about the number of hours that we're, you know, dealing with it. And also we have this uh, uh, exposure to the technology, to, uh, to the, I'm sorry, to the blue light, I mean, to the screen. And it's been shown that looking at the screen, uh, screen directly is like a seven inches screen for like one hour, that would, that would decrease the secretion of melatonin for 45 to 70 percent so i'm just killing the secretion of my melatonin if at night the time that my brain my mind is going to slow down it's going to, i mean when we have the sun down we need to have the technology down right so okay that's fine we use the technology during the day but let's refrain from using mobile computers tv whatever uh, during the evening time all right. Yeah. And and not only that, but 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 also uh, uh, it, it's really important that uh, technology can be useful because it, it enriches our social interactions with the other people. Uh, uh, we are just, you know, lighting up our rooms with uh, with lights, with bulbs. And that is that needs also to be regulated. So let's just dim the light after 9 p.m. Let's not use TV, mobile cell, mobile phones, or, or I mean, uh, computers and stuff like that. Let's refrain from drinking whatever stimulant drinking, uh, uh, drinking any stimulant substance like caffeine, like coffee or, or, or tea or chocolate, stuff like that. Let's refrain from them. Or whatever is taken as a stimulant to our brain and by experience, I listen to my biology, I listen to myself and I know if I eat that stuff, I wouldn't be able to have a restful slumber. So by that, I would not take it from this time later. Also, let's take care about uh, some, some uh, 
uh, uh, positive sleep-related habits that we collectively refer to them as sleep hygiene measures, okay? So if the people just look for the word sleep hygiene and Google it, they will find a bunch of data there. So just follow the sleep hygiene checklist. Make sure that we're going to do it right and even more precise from now on. And by this, we're going to just uh, provide ourselves with a gift, and that is the sweet slumber. And that is the beautiful experience of refreshing and good sleep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. Oh gosh, isn't that yeah. a problem? It's uh, it, you know, it's like setting boundaries for yourself. It's easy to set boundaries for your kids, right? But when it's we as adults uh, having to monitor and control our own usage uh, with technology at night, what I also found out is not only, like you said, it has adverse effect on your sleep. But you know that blue light is not good for your vision and your skin. Correct. To me, Correct. that's really important. You know, as you age, you got to wear those reading glasses, and it's not good for your skin uh, from for many reasons. You know. That's right. That's so, right. So, and you know, Miss Brown, the the other thing is that sometimes well, what we 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 got to be uh, quite cognizant about is that some people would have this disruption of mm -hmm. the sleep wake pattern specifically in, uh, in the aging process. When you have the process of accelerated aging or they got problem with the secretion of the melatonin, many seniors, they come to our uh, setups and they complain about, yeah, you know what, we sleep late and we wake up really late. Or sometimes we sleep, okay, in the right time, but after like a couple hours of sleep, we suddenly wake up and then we find it really difficult to fall back asleep, right? So by this, there is some disruption or dysregulation of the secretion of melatonin and also the expression of the genes that they are responsible for the production of melatonin and other related proteins of the brain, all right? So by this, sometimes we need to use uh, the supplementary melatonin. But I am going to just re-emphasize emphasize this as a key fact. Melatonin is a still a medication, is a still a drug. So we need to be pretty cautious about overusing, although it is an OTC medication, we can, we can just uh, go and buy mel melatonin without prescription. Even. But using the melatonin has got a specific formulations and timing, dosage instructions. So we need to be cognizant about the timing and the dose that melatonin is prescribed to the seniors at night to set them back to the right sleep-wake schedule, number one. And also in the morning, when we have the carry-on effect of the melatonin and the, and, the, and the senior subject is finding it very difficult and very, very, you know, struggling to get out of the bed in the morning. And it got, I mean, like, like the foggy brain in the morning, okay? By that, we're just submitting them to light. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to stop the process of the melatonin action in the brain. So we slow down the function of the melatonin by exposing the people in the morning time while they are having their breakfast enjoyably, okay? So they are exposed to blue light. They are exposed to, to light. And it also has dosing instructions. It also has the, I mean, the duration stuff like that. So we need to know that for the chronotherapeutics, we also got to see a doctor. It's not like, okay, I take like a, 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 like, a, 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 like a number, a handful of uh, melatonin tablets, and in the morning, I'm going to have the sunlight, and that's up. It's gone. No, uh, it is complicated in some instances. We need mm -hmm. to consult uh, with, the, with an expert, and we need to find the best way which is going to help us uh, as sure. best as possible. Okay. Sure, sure. Now, one last question, okay? Now, what are your thoughts on the potential of using medical marijuana to induce a better night's sleep? Yeah, marijuana is, marijuana is you know, uh, is, a, is a hot topic. And we have got so, uh, so many uh, scientific uh, notions and also evidence to support and also to counteract the beneficial effects of marijuana. Marijuana is a, is a medicament. And uh, it has potential to modulate the, the uh, I mean, the, the kind of uh, transmitter system in the brain, which is called the cannabinoid system. So marijuana and the effective substance in the marijuana, which is called THC, is agonizing, is, is causing an effect on those, uh, I mean, uh, cannabinoid receptors. So the more we use marijuana, the more parched 
the brain would be to get even more Mariana. And that is not only the physical dependence, but the psychological dependence. That is different to the opioids, because for the opioids, we have more physical dependence. But for Mariana and stuff like that, for cannabis, people will have the more psychological dependence. And we find it really helping with the people who got sleep problem. Okay. So some people, they, they seek uh, advice from the healthcare provider to use the, the, the THC oil or cannabinoid oil, or they are, they are also, you know, spraying the cannabinoid oil in nostrils. So they might be using the patches. They might be using the creams. They might be taking, or they might be smoking marijuana or cannabis or the THC or uh, cannabinoid oil. But yeah, in short term, that's really a that, 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 that works like a magic. I mean, that, that helps them to have a very deep down stage of sleep, not never like, like never before. But here's the problem. When I over when I continue using cannabis for the betterment of, our, of my sleep, then the mechanism in the, in the brain that they are being linked to the cannabinoid system in terms of initiating and maintenance of sleep will be dependent to the cannabinoid system. Mm -hmm. So by time that I, I withdraw myself from cannabis, then that's the beginning of the burden. I would start having insomnia. I would have insomnia even worse than before. And the next time that I'm going to get back to cannabis, that wouldn't do the trick like before. You know what I mean? So it's mm -hmm. like a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm doing well, I'm not doing well, I'm doing worse. And then I'm trying to get well, it's not like before. And then I will just get into trap and another trap and another trap. So it's really important. It's good, but under advice of a well-trained certified sleep expert, it, it can be prescribed uh, the, the, the derivatives of, uh, of tetrahydrocannabidol uh, or THC is being prescribed uh, in different formulations, but it should be under the care and control and monitoring of an expert physician. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you so much just for this wealth of knowledge and underscoring the value of sleep and quality sleep for, I guess, everybody, right? Particularly seniors. So is there anything else that you would like to add? No, the only thing that I just wanted to say is, is that I really, I, I, I want to cherish this opportunity and cherish this moment because, because this, this is being streamed in media and people have watched it. Maybe the people will, will watch it later on and that's going to be there forever. So many people later in following years will, will see this. And if I and you together could at least partly enhance the understanding and the attitude of the people to the significance and salience of the problem of sleep, then we have done our mission. I mean, we, the mission is completed so far. So, uh, and I would like to, to appreciate you for, for the efforts you put into this, for making this happen. And thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And we'll catch up later. Bye-bye. Okay.